Thank you so much to everyone who's joined us. Uh, we are giving just one more moment or so for uh, HAB members to join us in the virtual space. I'm Erica Warren, and um, I am a partner facilitator with Try Excellence. Dr. Stephen Holt uh, is also joining us today. Uh, we are proud to um, be daughters and sons of this community and helping to facilitate this very important conversation uh, with the historic Albina uh, Advisory Board and those who have deep roots and legacy in this area and how this project could uh, be of benefit uh, to this community as we work to improve uh, safety uh, on the highway there. I see some more of our HAB members joining us for those who are here uh, to join us from the community at large. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. Uh, I see we might have a couple uh, who will be potentially giving public comment. There will be an opportunity at some point in our meeting to do so. Uh, and so govern yourself accordingly. If you have technical difficulties, there's a number there uh, on the screen for you to text or call uh, and they'll be able to give you some assistance we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. It's a little difficult sometimes to manage all of the screens and people coming in and out. So if my eyes are looking weird, uh, please bear with me. Thank you again. We're going to get into this agenda. We'll have an opportunity for some public comment. Uh, and then Ms. Megan will give us the director's update. Uh, we'll have some uh, feedback from some of the previous conversations and responses to uh, things that board members have asked uh, in prior meetings. Uh, we will get um, the privilege to hear from Maria and David who will share about ODOT's action on social equity. Uh, we will continue our conversation around youth engagement opportunities uh, and our conversation around performance measures uh, and what outcomes uh, we are looking to see as a result of our collaborative effort on this project. So next slide, please. You all should be very familiar, but for those who are new in the space with us today, your voice matters. Uh, you know I'll be calling on folks because I know you have something great to contribute uh, all of our collective brain trust is what helps us uh, to move forward in this process. Uh, we trust that you'll speak your authentic truth, uh, that you will listen to each other uh, and to um, um, the information with understanding, listen for understanding. Uh, in this arena, we have some passionate conversations, but we appreciate that you deal with the issues and not with people. Uh, sometimes again, in these passionate discussions, we'll experience a bit of discomfort. In light of that, we ask that you remain respectfully engaged. Uh, those who are engaging and who can, please have your camera on. Uh, we understand sometimes uh, with our internet uh, need dependency challenges, uh, we may have to have our cameras off. Uh, so please do so if you need. And then uh, expect and accept non-closure. We won't solve everything today, but this is forward progress, hopefully, and moving um, into something that is beneficial, uh, groundbreaking, and uh, that we can all be proud of at the end of this. So next slide, please. Right, I believe that Ms. Natalie is going to help me with public comment today. Ms. Natalie, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you, Erica. Um, I will just go ahead to the next slide and uh, remind members of the public viewing the meeting on the live stream. Um, that we are inviting you to make a verbal public comment by phone at this time. And if you would like to do that, um, please dial the phone number shown in the upper right corner of the slide here, and then enter the meeting ID and passcode that are shown below. And after doing so, you will be placed in a virtual waiting room until your turn to speak. And when the time comes, we'll invite you to unmute yourself and speak your comment, and you will have up to two minutes um, and then we'll be muted at time. And if you'd like to provide more extensive comments to members of the HAB, please see the options listed on the meeting agenda. In addition to any verbal comments we heard today, we had two written public comments directed to the HAB that were shared with HAB members in advance of today's meeting. 
And if you are joining us on the live stream, please remember to mute yourself um, to minimize any feedback. And with that, I will go ahead and check our waiting room. And it looks like we do have one public commenter at this time. Um, it is uh, Richard Chavez. I will admit that person into the room and go ahead and share our on-screen timer. Changing screen here. And um, with that, uh, Richard, you should have been admitted into the space. And if you'd like to make your comment, uh, please dial star six to unmute yourself. And the floor is yours. Looks like you are in the meeting space right now. Are you able to unmute yourself? Richard, are you, Chavez, are you there? I am here. Hello. Great. Thanks for joining us. We're ready to uh, hear from you if you have a comment for the HAB or question. I do not. I am uh, with WSP, and this is my first meeting. Uh, happy to introduce myself to folks. Um, I am um, here in the San Diego area, focused a lot on performance measures of transportation projects my career, and uh, I'll be um, assisting the WSP team and, and ODOT on this project. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you <laughs> today. <laughs> Yeah, let me see if I can get my camera on here as well. Say hi to everybody. Indeed. Good to have you. Thank you. Yes, thanks for having me. Natalie, do we have others uh, that may be uh, here for public comment? No, it looks like we do not, uh, Erica. No other, no, anybody else in the waiting room? So I can go ahead and share my screen again. Awesome. Well, thanks for your help, Natalie. Thank you to those who are joining us uh, who may be just tuning into the live stream. Uh, please avail yourself to the other um, avenues that you can utilize to um, leave comments uh, for uh, this board and for uh, project leadership in regards to the project. Uh, with that, I am going to turn our meeting over to the very capable and wonderful Ms. Megan Channel. Thanks, Erica, and good evening, uh, Historic Albina Advisory Board. Um, before I start my remarks, it actually, it, it just kind of struck me today. This is our first um, anniversary slash birthday um, to celebrate uh, the Historic Albina Advisory Board. So we've been together for a year, and I'm just really looking forward to another um, and more ahead with each of you. So thanks for your ongoing commitment, your leadership, um, and, and the conversations that we get to have together. So just wanted to start off with a thank, a key thank you to each and every one of you. Um, first, I uh, just have a couple updates um, on you know, questions and items that have come up in the past, uh, but just wanted to first start off that for those of you that have attempted to go to our project website, um, we have been uh, having some uh, complications on the back end. So apologies uh, for any um, confusion or hassle in getting to that. Uh, the project webpage is restored, um, and so uh, here you'll be able to continue to have access to all of the project materials. Uh, and then we also are taking, uh, based on your leadership, uh, an upgrade to the project website in the coming month here with uh, implementing the new uh, brand um, and kind of uh, community feel as we go forward with the project as well. Um, so be on the lookout for that new website soon, but just kind of wanted to, again, apologize for any inconvenience that the web page issue has caused, uh, but you should be able to get back on and get that information. So thanks for bearing with us. Um, I also know uh, of primary um, kind of uh, interest of this group is understanding sort of where we are with partnerships. Um, I know I've reported in the past on status of the governor's letter of agreement with partners. I am excited to report this evening that that governor's letter of agreement is in its final stages and it's out for the partner signature. Um, so it's in the process of being finalized. And then once that letter is signed, that really allows us as ODOT to work directly with the city of Portland um, on the necessary intergovernmental agreement. 
um, to kind of define specific roles and responsibilities uh, and how we proceed forward in the project. So we're eager, eager to start that work. Um, so just wanted to give also an update on where the governor's letter is standing. Um, by way of other project activities, I know I mentioned to you before that our finance plan was in development. Wanted to give kind of a, a key update on that. Um, the finance plan continues to be in development. Uh, we were slated to present that to the Oregon Transportation Commission this upcoming Thursday at their meeting. Um, however, uh, we are extending the delivery of that um, to a future meeting uh, for a couple of key reasons. One is that the federal Build Back Better bill is still under discussion. That's the federal reconciliation bill. And with the uh, Build Back Better bill being um, a likely and uh, viable source of funding for us, should it pass at the federal level, there's still a lot of uncertainty around that. And so we're holding until we know more um, on the, uh, the federal opportunity ahead. And then secondly, the uh, Transportation Commission is having some conversations just on how the um, infrastructure bill, the newly passed infrastructure bill uh, will be uh, sort of uh, fitting within the state of Oregon. And we just wanna make sure that we're in sync with their policy direction that's gonna be coming over the coming months. Um, so for those reasons, we're holding on delivery of the finance plan until we have a little bit more certainty. We'll continue to develop and refine um, our understanding of the project design um, and the project cost uh, associated with that as well. So finance plan continuing to develop um, and we'll continue to uh, reach back with our HAB as we know more um, around, again, the Build Back Better plan, um, as well as the Transportation Commission's feedback on the infrastructure bill. So those are kind of the two key pieces I wanted to make sure that the group was updated on today. Um, I also wanted to touch base on next steps and sort of what we have by way of uh, our year ahead in 2022 milestones. So Natalie, there you go, go to the next slide. Um, this is really just a high level overview of kind of the programmatic uh, project timelines. Um, you know, wanna talk about just some near term and later term milestones as we develop the project. I'll highlight that this year, 2022, is gonna be a big design year for us. Um, I know we've initiated a lot, some of the design conversations, uh, but continuing to engage um, around uh, the elements that James has brought forward with you and more to come this year, and then hitting big milestones at the end of this year around um, the development design for early work packages A, um, as well as early work package B, so that we are uh, rounding out into construction uh, starting towards the end of next year for those, uh, for those work packages. We'll also be working on the updated environmental review um, that we're doing to incorporate hybrid three into the design. Um, so that'll be a key focus for us in 2022. And again, ongoing conversations with the HAB um, around, the, around the highway cover conversation. Um, I'll also note uh, that this year for 2022, kind of linking an update on our COAC, um, the COAC this week is having their final touch point with the diversity and subcontracting plan. And so um, as we're rounding out this year, this is or kicking off this year, um, the diversity and subcontracting plan is really ODOT's first time having a final diversity and subcontracting plan on a project. And with that, it's gonna allow us to advance conversations around early work package development and really initiating some outreach to the community uh, to begin some pre-construction services uh, and provide te technical assistance in implementing that diversity and subcontracting plan again, as we look towards construction next year uh, at the end of 2023. So those are just some key updates. Uh, I'm happy to pause and uh, answer any questions from the group as well. Thank you, Megan. Uh, any questions from HAB members in regards to uh, anything Megan provided on the update? I know we're having some computer challenges. Mr. Edwards, were you trying to unmute? No, I was not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Any other hands or questions uh, regarding the update? Seeing none, you all know that you can always 
uh, reach out to me. I will make sure to uh, forward questions, uh, comments, or concerns to the project team uh, as we work together. Um, I want to pivot. Uh, excited. Thanks again, Megan, uh, for that. Uh, it is exciting to me that that we are having some progress on that uh, governmental uh, agreement and um, moving this process forward. Uh, I, we have with us today uh, Maria Ellis and David Kim uh, with ODOT, and they're going to be sharing with us um, ODOT's action on social equity. Uh, they had an opportunity to share with the COAC at their last meeting. And this information is really critical in regards to, I think the values of this project and uh, overall progress at ODOT. So with that, David and Maria, thank you so much. I will turn it into your capable hands. Thank you so much. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Um, so first, I just want to say thank you so much for having David and I here today. Um, we really appreciate the work that the HAB is doing uh, in, in partnership with ODOT to help advance this project, which is very important on very many fronts. Um, uh, as mentioned, my name is Maria Ellis. I am the Economic Equity Manager at ODOT within the Office of Social Equity and the Urban Mobility Office. Um, Today, uh, we're gonna provide a very timely overview of some of the work that we are trying to do here at ODOT to advance social equity. Um, but I also know that to, to kind of understand where what we're trying to achieve, I, uh, we're gonna to have to give you a little history about how, how young this office is to begin with. Um, the Office of Social Equity um, is, uh, is, was part of, came about as part of a redesign by our director, Director Strickler, um, who stood up the office with the intent of um, creating a more comprehensive and uh, realizing more comprehensive advancement towards our goals on social equity and being able to serve all Oregonians, particularly those that um, we have that have been excluded from benefiting from our projects historically. Um, Nicotris Perkins, as many that many of you know, was the first assistant director of this division and she started in March, 2020, which is exactly the time that we started COVID. So that just gives you an idea of how young our office is and um, how we are growing. We are trying to cultivate and grow in a time that has been full of change for everyone. Um, uh, I want to start on this slide because it's important to see, uh, this is the vision for us. This is the vision of where we wanna be in 2030. Um, we are clearly uh, not here yet, but this is what we wanted to work towards. The, the writing here is very small, so I'm just going to breeze through these real quick, which is that ODOT um, has, uh, poli follows policies and procedures that promote a diverse workforce, and that's really trying to have our workforce better reflect um, the demographics of those that we serve, um, that we have stronger uh, partnerships with BIPOC women and others that historically uh, BIPOC community women and others that have been historically marginalized as uh, within our work, that we have programs that prioritize equity in planning and risk assessment. So how are we selecting projects um, and who are those projects benefiting? Um, that we are hearing all of the voices that need to be have, have input into our work and that those voices are actually influencing the direction of our work. Um, that projects are benefiting those that have they, they have harmed in the past. Um, and that uh, we are, indus our industry partners are being held accountable to our own social equity goals as well as, as they partner with us in some of our work. So that's our vision for 2030. Um, like I said, we're starting out and it's, and it's a big lift. Um, the office is, uh, many of you are, are, are very familiar with the Office of uh, Civil Rights. They run all of the federal programs um, for ODOT here. It's everything from OJT to our apprenticeship. They set um, DBE goals. The Office of Social Equity actually sits over um, the Office of Civil Rights, OCR as we call it, and OCR has been folded in. They continue to do all of their great work, um, but the Office of Social Equity has a much broader mission than just administering those programs. It's really about um, figuring out, uh, advancing our internally, our social equity, and making sure that our programs go beyond just compliance, but really advancement of our social equity goals um, the, uh, as part of our work. 
So this team is new. <laughs> uh, most of us have been here a year or less. Um, I just, in fact, uh, being, I think I was Nicotris's first hire and I just completed my one year anniversary in late December. So, um, uh, and each of us has a very different portfolio, whereas mine is really working on um, fig, uh, advancing ways to um, for, uh, bypass, uh, to, excuse me, my words have left me after a lot of meetings today, apparently. Um, uh, uh, my work is around advancing economic opportunities to our contracting and employment for BIPOC and women-owned firms. Um, we have, I have other colleagues who are really in the policy space and trying to uh, review all of our policies, both here at ODOT and DMB, for how we can make them more equitable, our language. Some are working on HR, some are working on engagement. So now we have a team of four, um, which is a big team, but we're doing a lot of work. Um, so I guess I, I want to say that making these kinds of social changes, as anybody who's been in this space understands, it is hard work. So some of the things that we're trying to do is educate on the, necess the necessity and value of equity, which is a pretty one-on-one basic thing, you know, that a lot of agencies have dealt with. But ODA is, is a bureaucracy, and we are still trying to make the value proposition for um, why not only is this the right thing to do, but there are... Um, there is a business case to, to be had for including um, equity across our work. We're trying to interrupt bias. We're trying to pivot um, long-standing institutional patterns of, well, this is the way we've done it forever. It doesn't mean that that's the way we have to do it in the future. And here's the reasons why we shouldn't do it that way anymore. Um, we're evaluating our investments um, to understand uh, who they're benefiting, who's benefiting, and who's being harmed by those investments. Um, and trying to figure out how to embed equity in guiding our actions um, and, uh, and our decisions and shifting culture, which is very hard work. Some of the things that we are coming up against as we are doing that work is either or thinking. It's a zero sum game. If somebody else is, you know, people who have power, if sharing power doesn't mean that you lose power. You're, 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 meet, you're trying to lift all boats and also sometimes course correct for folks that haven't had any power and really giving them an outsized opportunity to, to come up to the same um, playing field. Power and hoarding, which is very normal in large institutions. Um, I'm not from Oregon, uh, but so I understand that the, there's a fear of conflict here. Um, and so moving through that and also creating the right to have conflict, because sometimes conflict is good. It helps us really daylight some of the things that we need to deal with. Um, and, and so it's both um, fighting the fear of conflict and also fighting for the right to have conflict. Uh, we are thinking through things like the timelines that, uh, the timelines and the plans that we create that perpetuate uh, white supremacy in that culture. Um, how to do it all, all at the same time and doing it well. And then things like equity washing, which are um, very harmful to the larger goal that we want to achieve when we are um, using equity as a, a reason to do something that we know isn't, uh, or what, uh, you know, for the lack of a better word, whitewashing, equity washing um, actions that we, we know could be done better. Next slide. So all that to say is um, a context of what <laughs> where our equity work is, which is pretty comprehensive, it's cultural changing, but there are things in motion. Um, this seems very simple. Um, this, this is our social equity lens. Um, again, for folks that have been working in this space, it, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense, common sense. But this isn't something that we've done in the past. So it is new for ODOT. And this is something we're trying to embed. Um, it has been embedded in everything from project delivery and how we select projects. So um, that process on STIP now has several questions that are asked as we're selecting projects and evaluating projects and what we're going to invest in and who's going to benefit from them. So um, I'm not going to read all of it because I think all of you have this presentation, but this is ODOT's social equity lens and we are trying to embed it at every point where we're making decisions. Um, we are asking ourselves these questions. Next slide. Other things that are in motion that this particular group might care about are things such as the disparity study and that will inform 
um, our, and assess our capacity to do uh, DBE contracting. Um, we know that in the past, we, uh, we've had very legal, but also um, conservative disparity studies. And it's important to really get a, a positive baseline or a really accurate baseline of where our capacity is on DBEs so that we can have reach goals that help us advance um, uh, a contracting for um, certified firms. We are also trying to figure out how to assess and dismantle some of the barriers that we've identified within ODOT that create barriers for BIPOC and women on firms. Um, I, Ontiveros and Associates is on this call and they have been working with us on this. Um, uh, we've developed a barriers analysis that, would, uh, that we published in uh, late 2021 and are about to publish our uh, solutions identified that address some of those barriers. Um, we also have a socially, uh, social equity index map, which um, David is gonna talk about here shortly, but that is a map that we are using um, to identify uh, where, where our projects intersect with communities that have had um, uneven outcomes, positive outcomes in the past and to address how, to assess how we can better meet their needs. Oof, it's been a long day. Um, current efforts being assessed uh, for efficacy, we know that we could do a bit more in our mentor provision program and that we definitely need to do more in our technical assistance area. Um, and then we're also figuring out strategies for supporting and expanded, expanding racial and gender equity as part of our work sites um, the, in, in our projects. Next slide. Other things that are happening at ODOT related to this, um, looking at our SAP goal, our SAP is our strategic action plan. We have some goals in here for 2022. Specifically, one of the goals is more dollars to BIPOC and women-owned firms. Um, some of the things that are included that were planned for 2022 that we're holding ourselves accountable to, um, this is to implement a plan for removing barriers facing BIPOC and women-owned firms and contracting with ODOT. Um, I'm happy to share some of the work that Ontiveros and Associates has helped us do on this front. Um, again, we are in the midst of developing our uh, of solutions and this implementation plan is coming in the spring that will have the, the roadmap, if you will, for specifically which, how we can dismantle the barriers that we've identified. We're working on a partnership strategy with uh, partners um, that we are tapping all the time um, and, you know, ODOT has not done a good job of engaging with our partners in the past. And when I say partners, I'm talking in this particular case, I'm talking about industry partners like trade associations. Um, we haven't done a great job of doing that in the past. Right now, we're doing it almost too much. And so trying to figure out a way to create some uh, benefit for them as they are helping and advising us. We also want to make sure that they are getting something out of this. So that is a mutually beneficial partnership. Um, we want to also um, uh, target training opportunities for uh, BIPOC and women-owned firms. We do some training and uh, technical assistance uh, through, through third parties, but we want to do better and have a more comprehensive plan to do that. And we need to do better on data collection. Um, we have a lot of collecting that is, uh, we do a lot of data collecting that is related to federal programs, but I think if we're really serious about moving towards social equity, we have to measure what we care about and do and create the systems that measure those things. And so being able to more readily be, uh, understand um, how DBE certified firms are, um, where they're bidding, where they're awarded, where they're not awarded, understanding why, um, how are we serving those firms in terms of um, training, and then also being able to develop a survey that tells us a bit about how we are serving them. Like, how do they feel we're serving? And we may be thinking that we're doing a great job, but often um, the customer experience is slightly different. So creating a uh, customer satisfaction survey. I think that was it for me. Good evening. Uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, I too wanna congratulate this board for meeting for the last year, uh, certainly a tr tremendous commitment. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, re review part of the kickoff meeting to really understand the true intent and purpose of this board. 
I'm David Kim. I'm the statewide project delivery manager for ODOT. I've been with ODOT for the last 18 years, with most of that time uh, working out of the Portland office. And I've been a public servant for the last 27 years. Uh, my position and a branch was created in 2018. And its primary purpose is to establish statewide standards of practice for how we deliver projects and to support projects that go through development, design, and construction. So the uh, uh, chart that you see in front of us, which we call a racetrack, is a high level overview of the ODOT projects on our books or what's, what we call our STIP. Uh, what's launched, uh, what's been launched for design, you see the active design projects, 242 uh, projects, and then what's uh, going in or active in construction. I'd say the overall uh, volume uh, for construction, we're averaging about 600 million a year. Uh, and so if you go 600 times four, which our STIP is a four year uh, cycle, you're, you're talking over, over $2 billion. And of the 242 projects that are active in design, one of those projects is the Rose Quarter project. Um, I'm also anticipating that with the infrastructure bill that Megan mentioned earlier, we're probably gonna look at about $200 million increase in our overall portfolio every year. So we're talking upwards of $800 million of transportation investments on the state transportation system. And with the rollout of ODOT's strategic action plan, a major focus has been, how do we apply social equity lens to project delivery? So in the world of project development, project design and construction. And Maria mentioned earlier, shifting of culture, and it starts with the people and it involves our project managers, our engineers, our technical professionals, our program managers, our construction personnel, our consultants, and our contractors. So this gives you a, a pretty good overview of just the portfolio of what we have and the opportunities that lie ahead for ODA as an agency implying social equity to statewide. Next slide. I would say that the process of developing, designing, and constructing projects is just as critical as the outcome of a completed transportation improvement. We have a number of programs to build our DBE or disadvantaged business enterprise. Uh, we conduct studies to determine where there are disparities in construction and set hard goals, and we hold our contractors accountable to them. There's definitely a workforce shortage today and getting into construction crafts and trades provides meaningful and sustainable work that provides family wage jobs. We currently have an incentive disincentive program uh, to encourage contractors to hire apprentices. And now we're looking to expand this program to include local hiring preferences as we're seeing on the I-205 project and establishing goals and targets for minority and women workers. Uh, from the equity lens for project delivery, we're looking at how, how do we better define and apply an equity lens throughout our project delivery processes, so that racetrack. We ask the questions of how does equity apply to people, processes, policies, programs, and projects. Specific to projects, we are integrating a social equity lens by having every project team answer a series of equity questions that Maria shared earlier. This is being applied to every ODOT project moving forward. This will help us gather information and data so we can baseline that and measure the progress we're making on the equity front. We know that uh, uh, we have maximum opportunities for diversity, equity, and inclusion into our projects that use alternative delivery, such as design, build, and CMGC, Rose Quarter being CMGC, construction manager, general contractor, delivery approach. We're growing our delivery tools to be able to leverage other approaches to projects rather than the conventional design, bid, build, where the focus has always been on price and least cost. Um, we formed a new urban mobility office that is responsible for some new and different approaches that the agency can learn from. I would say a new terminology that has come out as we explore and learn how climate and equity is being applied is emerging practices. My goal is to turn these emerging practices into best practices and apply that across ODOT's portfolio of over 300 projects. Uh, the uh, Urban Mobility Office was able to obtain FHWA approval on this local hiring preference for the $300 plus million I-205 project. We're gonna learn from that and see how we can apply local hiring preferences to other uh, projects across the state. As it relates to uh, partnerships with trade associations, I believe relationships are key 
to the work that we do, whether it be in our communities, our consultants, or our contracting partners. We've developed strong relationships with many of the minority contracting trade associations, including NAMAC, AWAMI, PBDG, Latino Built, and others, to truly understand the opportunities, barriers, and challenges they face as it relates to doing work for ODOT. We learned that cash flow and getting paid quickly is critical for many of the smaller construction contractors and are taking steps to make this happen. We're also trying to grow the pool of ODOT contractors by exploring what it would take to create a new small prime contractor development program. There's a best practice out of the state of Florida and we're seeing what, what it would take for ODOT to mirror a similar program like that to get more firms certified and build that pipeline of workers. Next slide. So we are able to leverage technology by using GIS to help identify and inform how transportation projects impact our communities and how they may present opportunities and challenges on the social equity front. We're using this map as a tool to assist us in applying a social equity lens to our work and provide the information necessary for Oregonians to hold us accountable to prioritizing equity. This map provides us with information related to age, ability, income, language, race, ethnicity, and where we may see disparity. This can then better inform ODOT where we can provide more opportunities to seek input and feedback to the voices that have historically not been heard as we develop our transportation solutions. For my closing comments, I wanna ensure that the work of this board is not a one and done, but that we will learn from this and we'll see how we can apply this across other ODOT projects throughout the state. We can do better and we will, and as was stated in, in the uh, kickoff meeting for this board, this is a journey. And uh, the more um, feedback and input that we get um, will help guide our journey to uh, the intent and outcomes that we all strive for. Thank you. With that, uh, Marie and I are ready to take any questions if, if board members have questions. That's awesome. David, Maria, thank you for that update. Wonder if there are HAB members who have questions uh, in regards to um, ODOT's equity plan. It's a quiet group today. Mm -hmm. Mr. Washington, are you unmuting? I see Dr. Richard with his hand raised. Dr. Richard. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the presentation. I got the what out of the presentation. What I'm kind of missing is the how. Mm. So again, oh, I'm sorry, my camera's not on, I apologize. So, you know, again, the informational piece is always great, right? It's always great to say, you know, what the aspiration is. Uh, and the inspiration is good. But when you take a process of this magnitude, I mean, we're talking over $1.5 billion. So it's, 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 it's a magnitudinal process. And if I'm getting ahead, I apologize. But what's the how? So there's many facets to uh, applying a social equity lens to our projects. I mentioned people, workforce. So we have to look within ODOT and look at our employees and better define uh, what does equity mean in the work that we do each and every day. And you know, a great start is ODOT has uh, established equity as a value. And I'm looking at creating um, a position description language that incorporates equity into every position description of our employees. So they have a clear understanding of what the expectation is as it relates to applying an equity lens in the work that they do, whether they're managing projects or delivering programs. When it comes to projects, uh, there's tremendous opportunities, whether it be uh, the impacts to the community, whether it be a workforce or whether it be contractors. And so um, right now we are in the process of developing our 2024 to 2027 STIP. And we have a number of key program areas. Every project that we scope is being asked to answer those five questions. 
And those five questions will help inform where there are opportunities that may impact um, not just the development and design and, and, and construction of that project, but may also impact funding to say, if I have two projects and one has a greater impact to equity, that project is gonna get prioritized at a higher level. So we have uh, a, a, a tool that we've created using that map and answering questions that will better help inform uh, the opportunities for equity. And then what we're gonna do is every milestone from the start of project to 30% design to 60% design, we're gonna measure how did the project team apply equity, whether it be through contracting processes or uh, uh, evaluating impacts to uh, the project that may have on a community, we're gonna document and capture all that. And then once that project goes into construction, we're gonna make sure that any commitments we've made follow through in construction. And at the end of construction, we're gonna see how we did through performance measures because we will now have data that we've never ever captured before as relates to equity. So that's some of the how. We have a long ways to go as we're learning. Um, uh, we've reached out to other DOTs across the country and they're actually looking at Oregon to say, what are you doing to advance equity? And so we're sharing information and looking at emerging practices and, and best practices. And then it's, it's engaging uh, 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 forums like this, advisory committees and boards to help inform ODOT and, and keeping ODOT accountable and, and, and uh, uh, ODOT coming and sharing the good work we do and being transparent with that. Yeah, I think it's hard because it's hard to come up with any satisfying answer to that because the fact is that we are ways, we're, we're, we're slower than even we want to be on this front. Um, uh, it is more incremental than, uh, uh, than any of us thought it would be, but we are chipping away at it slowly. What I put in the chat is one more concrete example possibly of how we are trying to chip away at this. It's, um, I've listed our barriers analysis, which is, uh, like I said, work that we just completed this portion. Um, it's a three-phase project. This, this is phase one of this project. Um, which is uh, being very honest with ourselves as ODOT, um, not pretending that we don't create barriers and, and actually coming to the table with just saying, nope, we create barriers, let's start there and figure out where those barriers are. Um, what are we doing to hinder these um, firms from participating um, and partaking in, 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 in the investment, in, in the contracting opportunities that these investments provide? Um, so this is, you know, this was actually, um, a pretty frank look at where we are falling short. Um, like I said, we are working on phase two and phase three of that, which is um, the solutions and then the, the and, and then the strategy, the who, when, where, how we are dismantling some of these barriers within our own agency. Um, and that's forthcoming here in the spring. But the fact is, uh, it is hard to actually say the full how because because we're because we're in the beginning of the slog that is a long-term commitment to this work. If I may, Erica, so it sounds like <laughs> you're building the boat as you're going across the water. And, and, and I'm not so sure that's a good strategy because I got 30 questions to ask, but I won't ask all 30 questions. So. Uh, I'm not comfortable with the, with the analogy building the plane as we're flying, because if you're trying to build the plane as you're flying, you really ain't flying. My last question, and then I'll yield back to my great friend, uh, Miss Warren. How will you measure the diversity return on the investment? So I think that is one of, so I'm going to speak first from just my small, small lane in this whole thing, which is, um, uh, Seeing, we need to see improved, in, improved um, access to the dollars that are in our contracting budget that are going to DBE, sort of in BIPOC and women-owned firms. That's how, in my lane, I'm measuring success, um, which is about economic opportunity. But there are other, that is not the only way that we should be measuring success. So the other ways include how is ODOT, um, um, what is our demographics and why do our demo and why do our demographics not match Oregonians? Um, uh, why should should we not be making our work sites that that construct our infrastructure 
um, create both economic opportunity and better reflective of the communities that we serve. Um, uh, I mean, I, so this internal, external, it's how are we resourcing equity this is, it's wonderful, right? That we have a division on this front, but also we've got four people and 5,000 staff. So that are working on this issue um, and really being able to fund this at uh, putting our money where our mouth is, right? In terms of both our investments and externally and internally about how we serve on equity. So there are a variety of ways that we should be measuring this. It's not, there's not one measure that can capture how well we're doing. We need to be able to, have multiple ones that cumulatively tell us a story about whether we're advancing or not. Does that answer your question, sir? You're still muted there. there uh, to, to be honest, no, it doesn't answer my question, but <laughs> you know, again, uh, I'm not so sure that we have time to you know, deal with this. And, and I must yield to others who may have questions, but I think it's imperative enough that we got to have a strategy in place, right? So again, when we say we're chipping at it, you know, when we say incremental, um, that scares me because something could get lost while we're chipping away. And I don't want to miss an opportunity to unearth gold nuggets and then the ethnic and diverse communities end up being on the same end of the spectrum that they've always been on when ODAT, ODOT rather implements projects. So, um, you know, again, I don't know if you all have who you all have around you uh, in terms of community folks. I don't know if you have a committee together uh, mm -hmm. that's comprised of ODOT folks and community members. And it doesn't have to be a large group, but uh, a group that can really help steer uh, and collaborate and inform as steps are being taken. Because with my good friend saying that she's not from Portland, well, that's also scary. Because if you're not from Portland, <laughs> right, how do you quickly... Uh, educate yourself and acclimate yourself to understanding the deep-rooted issues, not mm -hmm. just from a historical perspective, because the narrative is out there, but there are some hidden gems and hidden treasures in the area in which ODOT is working that you would only know if you've ever lived in this community. Mm -hmm. So that would be my suggestion. Yeah. Make sure that you surround yourselves with individuals, and there's a lot of people on this committee that are far better at this than I am because they've been around longer than I have. So might wanna form about a good nine member committee to help you move that forward to make sure you don't miss anything. Thank you for your answers. And I yield back to Erica. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Are there others uh, on the have who have questions uh, for David or Maria? I'm scrolling to see all the hands, if there are any. Not seeing any, I, I, I will say that um, David and Maria, I appreciate um, the work that you all are doing. Uh, and as Dr. Richard said, uh, the, the uh, hidden and best resource for knowing how to reach that are, are folks who have lived through and have the experience in this area. Uh, I don't know if it's something that you would consider, but I think it's a, a great start. Uh, we appreciate seeing some of those uh, measures uh, and understanding better how we can help to hold the agency accountable. But thank you all for being with us today. Uh, and I'm sure, are you all open? Um, if folks have additional questions uh, that they could send you all could send those comments or questions to me and I'll make sure that David and Maria have those uh, as they move forward in this work. Thanks again to you all. Uh, I'm going to shift, uh, Natalie, uh, thank you guys uh, for attending with us. I'm going to shift and we're going to jump back into a conversation uh, that we began uh, in our last meeting around youth engagement opportunities. And uh, this is uh, an exciting, um, uh, 
topic because I think it is in response to a number of you all's um, request and idea that the work that we're doing here together should be multi-generational, that there are some components that we want to make sure um, have been seen, touched, uh, and uh, thoughtfully considered amongst our young people uh, who will be uh, greatly impacted by the work that we're doing here today. Um, and so um, we're gonna shift into that piece. Uh, I, as many of you all know, um, your colleague, um, uh, Sprinavasa Brown on the HAB uh, is um, facilitating some uh, opportunities uh, for us to engage around the work that she is doing at Camp Elso. Um, currently, they engage uh, Black and Brown youth in a purposeful way, uh, and we have been uh, partnering together, meeting together to decide how can we best facilitate and coordinate with their group and other youth leadership organizations uh, to create um, a wide reach. Um, we wanted to talk with you further about engagement and youth of color and uh, how we might do that in a more uh, succinct way. Um, one opportunity uh, that presented by the Camp Elso team, uh, they will be doing um, a workshop, uh, an opportunity at the end of one of their cohorts, uh, May 14th. And uh, this is great timing for us, um, as Megan mentioned, it's the timing for the early work package. Uh, and so, what we heard from you all in our uh, design collaboration forum, where we repurposed to talk about some of these things deeper, um, is an interest in focusing on design input, a desire to help guide youth, uh, and the importance of culturally sensitive input, uh, and uh, an input to follow up the workshops with some de deeper engagement. Uh, and two-way dialogue to ensure that the scope uh, and impact of their input is clear. Uh, communication around how the youth can engage in the project uh, in other ways. Uh, and so our team is looking uh, to you all to help direct us uh, in the community. Uh, and so I'd like to uh, ask you some questions. This photo that you're seeing uh, is um, from the Ruby Bridges Walk to School Day event. Uh, that uh, Kairos held earlier. Uh, and uh, this was before this kind of recent uh, Omicron wave, uh, but we are looking for other opportunities and looking to your wisdom, uh, as Dr. Richard mentioned earlier, about how we would engage youth of color on this project. And so I have some questions uh, and um, I'll start maybe to get us thinking and open the discussion around other groups and organizations that you all believe are important uh, to include uh, in this effort, um, other organizations or ideals uh, that you all have that we can leverage to make sure we are casting a wide net, uh, and uh, thoughts around approaches or outcomes that this group sees as important uh, in relationship to engaging a youth of color uh, on this project. So I wanted to take a moment and open the discussion to have members. Um, I appreciate uh, Mr. Washington's comments and others uh, around this, the historical um, um, information that needs to be shared with young people in regards to this area, uh, the significance of this project, and then how sensitive we are to collecting uh, and making sure that their voice is heard uh, in regards to um, uh, design elements and other things related to the project. So I want to open the discussion um, and ask if HAB members have input into uh, their thoughts, other engagement opportunities, organizations that you believe we definitely should include. Um, I know that we're having conversations with iUrban Teen and others, uh, and also that there are components in regards to the workforce piece uh, that um, I know uh, Antoveros and Associates and others are working uh, with the COAC and um, our CMGC, but this is specifically around youth engagement, how we get our young people. I see your comment, BEAM uh, should be included. Uh, others uh, on the HAB, I'll open the discussion. Mr. Edwards, I know this was 
uh, a really strong uh, area of advocacy from you. And so we wanna make sure that we are um, being responsive to you all and that this is uh, something that you feel um, we are doing in the right manner and utilizing your wisdom and collective um, network to make sure we do this well. I see Leslie's comments in the uh, chat. I know we have a number of folks who are having some connection issues and have their cameras off today. POIC, Rosemary Anderson um, High School. Other thoughts? Mr. Washington, I see that you unmuted. I would be remiss to miss this opportunity to, to continue to talk about, you know, how we unpack uh, opportunities beyond construction, that parallel construction. Okay, and so, you know, cause whenever we look at these things, uh, it's been my experience over the years, we look at them in silos, you know? So if you're in construction, if it's a highway, if it's ODOT, but very rarely, even when you see the contracts go out, you know, from the contracting and state contracting and all that, they, they don't, there are other people and other types of businesses that support construction, you know? So if we're gonna reach young people, not only should we just reach them that are interested, but we need to make sure that we show them how to associate what they do with how it can parallel and they can benefit from opportunities that are in something like construction. So it's always been my thing to always talk in these groups and in these boards and all this about unpacking this to reach a, a larger impact radius with people so that we can involve and more people benefit just than just a narrow scope and spectrum of opportunity. So I would suggest we do that also with this, the search for young people. And that is in, in looking at, you know, all the age brackets from college right on down to high school or even grade school is that there is exposure and that we show connection between all the different types of pathways of, of, of economic strategies or businesses or whatever is that we show how their business is associated with this in parallel. So that was just something that I, I just was thinking about when you were doing, making the comments. there. Thank you, Mr. Washington, much appreciated. Other questions, input comments? I see some additional thoughts in the chat. Mr. Edwards, I see your hand. Thank you very much. And I, I apologize, uh, Erica. I, I had a call that I had to take from back east. So I've been on the call for a few minutes. So uh, some of these issues that I wanted to bring forward may have been covered. Um, and if they have, uh, please stop me and, and, uh, and let me know. Um, I was, when we talked about the, um, the, um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion policies, I didn't know whether ODOT was talking about internal and external or just external. Um, I wanted to know what kind of policies they're talking about that they have in place. Is, you know, a written policy, is it, what is the enforcement of that policy? Is there any disciplines attached to that policy when someone violates it? Um, do, is there a chance for um, re-educating people so that they don't violate the policy going forward? Um, are they doing surveys, um, evaluations? Are they talking to their current BIPOC employees and getting um, input from them to know that the policy is working and it's viable and makes sense? Um, and I didn't know what OCR was, and um, that might have been defined, but I didn't. I didn't. All I saw was an acronym. Those are great questions, Maria and David. I'll leave it open to you. No problem with us heading back. So yeah, those are the kinds of things that we are currently working on. I mean, it just is an example of just on a baseline level where we're at. We're still working on trying to get equity and meaningful equity at that included in everyone's 
position description. Um, so this is pretty, uh, we're, we're starting kind of a, a, a ground floor, unfortunately, on some of this work and it's taking time. So, um, and we're, uh, you know, at figuring out how to add it to our performance evaluations is the next step so that it's not just, you know, flowery language on the equity side in our, in our position descriptions, but that it's actually part of our evaluation as employees. Um, to see how we're performing against those values is really important. Um, but so that's just that's just one, the, I guess the problem, this is really comes back to that issue of comprehensiveness that we were talking about, that I was trying to mention earlier in that presentation, which is there's so many places where this needs to be addressed and lifted up and highlighted and built out um, that it, almost overwhelming, right? <laughs> for a small for a small group of our size, for a small group of our size in a 5,000 person agency. Um, but we're, we are chipping at it, but to your point on, on, the, on the internal side, that is how, that is the ground level we're at. OCR um, stands for the Office of Civil Rights. They are inside ODOT and underneath the Office of Social Equity and they run and manage um, ODOT's federal programs that relate to workforce, CBE, um, OJ, um, OJT, and whatnot. And they do our disparity study. Do you want to add more to that, David? Yeah, so we do have policies within ODOT related to respectful workplace harassment and discrimination. And those policies are mandatory uh, policy reviews and trainings that every ODOT manager employee has to go through before the end of the year. And they're actually tracked. And so, and then on the construction side, we have equal employment opportunity uh, programs, and we are exploring uh, some other best practices in the industry, such as Rise Up, Safe from Hate, and looking at ways to embed those types of programs and resources to all employees that work on ODOT contracts. So we have a ways to go, but we're starting to have those conversations right now. The last thing I'll add on that point real quick is that it's hard because we can add all of these things right into these performance evaluations into position descriptions, we can write spec, but it really comes down to a cultural shift where people understand, like rather than having it be something that is, we, we do have to have consequences, absolutely. Also, it should just be about compliance um, and consequences. It should be about culturally us shifting our thinking as a whole, as an agency, where and educating folks to the basic understanding that this is something that we, every single person in our agency needs to care about. It's not just the people in the office of social equity that need to care about this. It's that every employee in the organization has a responsibility to understand how and use that ex social equity lens as part of their work. And that is, that is a harder thing to measure. That is a harder thing to be held accountable to is changing behavior and thinking. Right, and it, it is a paradigm shift in our approach. And so the good ex the example I, I like to share with our employees and managers is we have a core value of safety within ODOT, right? We, we're responsible for safety of our own, ourselves, our colleagues, and, and those that we work with. And it's a value that each and every employee understands and owns. Same applies for equity. It's not, oh, it's, it's Office of Social Equity that's responsible for it. We all own it. We all have to define what equity means to each one of us. And a big shift uh, and, and Dr. Richard uh, said earlier, you know, you can't go incrementally. Well, a big shift, and I've been with ODOT for 18 years, and a big shift that has happened is, is the commitment of, of social equity has to start at the top. And under Director Strickler's leadership, he's created an assistant director position for social equity. So that truly demonstrates the commitment that he has as the leader of our agency to social equity. It, it provides resources to where now we can apply an equity lens to our policies, to our programs, to our projects where we didn't have that before. And I see that office to be a resource for people to use, not to say, oh, they're responsible for it and tell us how to do it. It's every employee owns it. And getting employees to have that mindset is very challenging because we struggle with safety. We have an annual safety stand down event because employees sometimes just take safety for granted. And just the struggles we have with safety every day uh, to say now we, we really want everyone to embrace equity and what that means is a challenge. And having an office that's devoted and committed to um, uh, having equity in front of us each and every day uh, will help with that culture change. 
We have diversity action teams in every part of the organization. I have manager, my own managers are involved in these diversity action teams, staying engaged with employees about how does diversity, equity, inclusion uh, apply to, to the, the engineers. Some of our engineers struggle with how it applies and, and giving them examples and coming up with creative ideas and, 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 and perspectives gets them to open their eyes, say, oh, you know, yeah, that does make sense that, you know, when I'm designing this, this road, what are the temporary impacts that it may have on a community or what are the permanent impacts it may have on community and that, you know, we need to ensure that we can provide access to all and not just for trucks or cars, but bike, pet and, and the disabled. So it's getting employees to talk about it and it, it's, make, it's starting to make that penetration. And, and I can acknowledge that we are act, actually having conversations each and every week. Thank you very much. That really helps me a lot. And I really appreciate the fact that you, you're you um, using um, safety and some of the um, things that you've learned through safety, those behaviors. I was going to mention that there's a, something called upstander, bystander. And that's where um, when you see something, you say something, you do something, you intervene in a way that's safe. And, if you're, and safety is something that you can all rally around. So that behavior that you've learned in safety about um, it's all we're all in this together can be transferred into the social equity lens as well. And so I certainly appreciate that and appreciate the fact that I think that um, you, you have folks there. I think it's an advantage. Um, it's a two edged sword, but it's an advantage to be just having a, a, a new program, a, a brand new program, because you can learn from others and, and make sure you get it right to begin with, because once you get, go down that road, you know, it's, it's difficult to get back on track. So I think you're, you're doing the right thing. So um, the other challenge, of course, is, you know, there's going to be folks that say you're not moving fast enough, but you have to be deliberate as well as, um, as cautious, because like you say, if you do go in the wrong direction, then it's really tough to get it fixed. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, I appreciate your remarks. And, um, and um, Maria, I appreciate your remarks as well. And I think we're going in the right direction. Just keep us abreast of what's going on. And certainly we want to, you know, be able to help in any way we can to make sure that we are going down that right path, to make sure that folks feel comfortable with in whatever workplace they're in. I do have one more comment, and that is uh, there is an opportunity that lies ahead for ODOT. Um, today, over 50% of our managers are eligible to retire. And I'd say over a third of our employees are eligible to retire. So there's a generational shift within the organization. And so as we work with our human resources partners and, and recruitments, how are there opportunities through uh, ODOT recruitments of uh, uh, gaining uh, workers that better uh, uh, reflect the communities we serve? So we're looking at the demographics of our agency and seeing is that the right makeup? Because you have to have a diverse workforce to really have those true conversations amongst the employees and getting that diff different perspective and truly embracing and understanding um, uh, what others have to bring to the table, which ultimately will play out in a similar type of environment when it comes to projects being developed and designed and constructed. Along those same lines, I'd encourage you to go out and talk to some fifth and sixth graders because they'll be in the workforce in 15, 20 years. Dr. Richard, I see your hand raised again. With everything Maria and David um, sort of expostulated in terms of the internal piece for ODOT, how are accountability measures uh, being implemented into that process? So we can say culture shift, great, right? We can say culture shift. Uh, we can say statements like challenging to change folks' behaviors and mindsets, okay? But, I, again, I could ask 30 questions that center around time frame, right? So, what happens when the desired culture shift doesn't happen? What accountability measures are being put in place? So when we look at accountability, um, we look at performance measures and performance measures based on data. So we have to have data. And so uh, in, in our world of workforce, we have performance evaluations where it's diversity is specifically called out. Can we strengthen that? Absolutely. Are there ways to do that? Absolutely. Have we done that? Not yet. I think in the world of project delivery, 
we're just starting to capture and identify what data fields we should be measuring to, to measure progress. And then ultimately it's, it's a commission, it's uh, agency leadership and every manager that should be holding ourselves accountable and, and the public should be holding this agency accountable. And it's, it's boards like this, it's commissions like this that can help hold the agency accountable as well. So let me rephrase the question. Let me rephrase it. So if you have managers who refuse or struggle or put up barriers and roadblocks with just implementing a basic social equity lens, how is accountability built in? Because what you're asking us to do as a community is continue to wait. You're asking us to continue to wait. So for somebody like me, who's been around 50 plus years, how much longer shall I wait for change? So again, that's why I wanted to rephrase the question because I get your plan, but what I don't hear in your plan is how is the accountability measures being built into that plan? So it's not just, so again, performance of, of measures or performance appraisals is just, that's something that a manager does with their team member. But again, if a manager, doesn't apply the social equity lens or they're putting up barriers to the community, how is accountability built in? So I'm gonna be honest and say, frankly, there are certain people who will never, ever, ever buy into this because their worldview is never gonna change. Um, um, they don't think this is to, has anything to do with them. They don't think this touches their life. They don't see anything wrong with the status quo. Um, and we will never change their mind. However, we do have things that we have to track and respond to. So it doesn't come down to, I'm going to change the, I'm going to help you change your mind because some people won't. Um, at the same time, you still need to deliver on certain things. So um, for instance, contracting, again, trying to figure out if our strategic action plan that goes to the Oregon Transportation Com Commission and that we are accountable to the OTC on says that we are going to drive more dollars towards um, or, or award more dollars to BIPOC and women-owned firms as part of our contracting. If we're not making progress on that, that is a measurable way that that is cross-cutting. That isn't about me. That's actually me plus project delivery plus OPO plus Office of Civil Rights. You know, it's it's all of us as that have a hand in that. And so all of us are held accountable because the agency has to be held accountable to those goals. So it's not a perfect answer, and but more to the point that we have strategic action plan goals that hold us accountable to measures because we may not be always able to shift people's perspective, but we have to, but we can make them deliver on a piece of work. I'll yield back to Erica, but it doesn't answer my question. And I think you all keep dancing around my question. Erica, if I can ask one more direct question. So if I don't follow the dictates of the strategic action plan, what happens to me? Do I get disciplined? Do I get terminated? Do I get suspended? What happens? And I think you all know where I'm going with accountability, simply because yes, when you say you have folks that have been there and they won't change, that right there is the problem. So how do we move people out of the way who won't change? I yield back to Erica. Thank you, Dr. Richard. I don't know if Maria or David wants you uh, comment, but I, I thought I heard that there, there are, uh, with your performance or your um, plan, there are actions uh, corrective actions, I would assume, as there would be with any uh, uh, employee who is not meeting their goals. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do either of you guys want to respond? Um, so, I mean, I feel like in this particular case, I want to definitely defer to David because he has an actual statewide team that he's managing. And as a manager, he could talk to you about the management structure. Um, but I will say that we are all being held accountable to our values and being um, assessed in our values. And if we're part of this, part of this is literally getting a score on how you're doing on, toward, on those values. 
one of them is being able to do this kind of work. It's not a specific, like, how are you doing with social equity? It's, are you a team? Are, are you following directions? Are you, are you, um, are, are you being a team player? Are you fi finding solutions for these things? Are you being showing leaders, leadership competencies in this space? Um, and those, I, I, I can't speak to whether they will be to the severity of those disciplinary actions because I'm not in HR, but, uh, but those are things that people are evaluated against and those evaluations go on your record. Yeah, so being a, a manager at ODOT and having about 200 employees under me and, and a dozen managers, it does start with clarity of expectations. If expectations are not clear, um, then got to start with that. So uh, once we have clarity of expectations, it's, it's at the end of the day, measuring outcomes. What did you deliver? And uh, defining clearly what the discipline is uh, and assessing whether that discipline is a work plan whether that discipline is training, whether that discipline is a performance plan. So depending on where the employee is, how much ownership they take, and whether they acknowledge that they have responsibility or not, and whether the expectation was clear or not. And uh, maybe for some, some managers and employees, it's training and getting them to truly understand what um, equity means. And so oftentimes it's meeting the employees with where they're at and seeing what's going to take for them to truly understand how equity applies to the work that they do each and every day. But it starts with clarity of expectations. And we are taking steps, as I mentioned, I'm working with my own diversity action team to develop a, a generic um, uh, uh, equity uh, language that goes into every position description in the general section of their position description, and then coming up with examples of how equity may apply to say our engineers or project managers that specific to their work so that managers have something to work off of. I am working that right now with HR and, and my, my workforce because they're going to help define it and own it. Thank you. Thank you all. We appreciate. I know that this is often a difficult conversation. Uh, Dr. Amato, I saw your hand raised. Did I lose her? While we're waiting for Dr. Amato, uh, Mr. Edwards. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I think what um, uh, Dr. Richard is talking about is a situation that a friend of mine um, told me about that um, they had a, an issue at their company where um, a uh, white supervisor had uh, made some inappropriate remarks to their uh, black uh, subordinate. And um, they had to keep pushing, pushing, and HR dealt with it, and and it kind of got swept under the rug. But they um, kept pushing, pushing, and finally, um, a discipline was meted out, and the um, the um, employee that um, the supervisor that had made those remarks was put on notice and discipline, and uh, they were um, also um, subjected to um, not subjected, but they were. Um, um, reprimanded and had to get um, additional training and at the same time they were it was made real clear that if there were any more infractions that they would not be employed at that um, company anymore i think that's what dr richard is talking about there has to be some accountability i'm not a zero tolerance person um, at least i try not to be but um it depends on the um how egregious the um, infraction is yep. um, but at the same time um, I think that there has to be some kind of discipline meted out because when there, there's certain things that happen and they may be insi insignificant to the perpetrator, but at the same time, it, it, it could be something that, can, that could be considered even lethal to the victim. And so those kind of things have to be nipped in the bud. They have to be dealt with with, um, with clear and concise discipline. And if they're not, then it, everything goes to hell in the handbasket. And that's that. I think that's what we're, we're talking about. Yes, so within ODOT, if we have made the expectations clear, um, we do have progressive discipline. We go through letters of expectation, then we go through letter of rep reprimand, and then we go through uh, uh, letter of reprimand with salary sanction, and then pre-dismissal and dismissal. So it is a progressive process and there's a lot of factors that will come into play 
in terms of how we assess uh, uh, the discipline. And we also have uh, uh, employees that are represented through unions, so it's, it's navigating through the bargaining agreement process as well. Um, and so I go back to having clear expectations. It, does the manager employee uh, understand what the expectations are of the work that they do as it relates to harassment, discrimination, racism, uh, respectful workplace um, policies? And if they're not following those and, and they don't have an out because again, every employee and manager is required to go through the policy reviews and acknowledge that they've gone through that. So there's no out. And so then we do fact finding and assess what, what happened. And based on that, we make decisions on what the appropriate discipline measure is. May I suggest that, you know, just like in safety, you know, uh, when you get the written, that 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 is your, um, you get a written and a verbal when you go through your safety policy. Each employee comes on board, they're, they're, they're given a written safety policy, policy and they're given a, a verbal um, a contract as well. And so when that's violated, depending on how egregious it is, that employee is gone. And, and I've, I've experienced both of those. I've been on a job site under construction where a couple of iron workers were gone at nine o'clock in the morning. They were fired because they violated the, um, the lanyard policy of tying themselves off. There was no, there was no reprimand. There was no opportunity to, um, to grieve the, um, the issue. It was a direct violation and there was no tolerance. It was a zero tolerance policy. And I think and depending on how egregious the issue is, that same policy should should hold for um, discrimination and, and racial bias as well. Because like I say, otherwise you could, you could end up with some situations that you don't wanna have to deal with. And, and I'll just be real clear about this because I believe this is real. I don't have any statistics to, to bear to, to support this, but I truly believe that when an employee leaves the, the, the place of work and they have a, a grievance that wasn't resolved and that they think or even addressed and they come back and they kill other employees in the workplace, that is that is that that was borne out simply because it wasn't dealt with properly in the beginning. And so we never want to get to that place. But at the same time, we have to realize that when someone says something to me, and you may feel that, oh, that's very simple. That, that's no big deal. Well, to me, that's, that's something that's got me hot enough to fry fish, hot in fish grease, I can tell you. And, and that may cause me to go a place that I don't ever want to go. And so we have to realize that, you know, and so, and, and be clear about that. So I just wanted to share that, you know, um, I, I like heading things off before we get there. And I think that we have to remember that everybody um, has a different uh, melting point, if you will. And we have to make sure that, that um, they're respected and everyone's um, treated decently. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Edwards. I'm gonna go to Dr. Amato uh, and then we will um, shift back into our um, youth engagement conversation. But I see a number of comments in the chat. I appreciate you all's engagement here, Dr. Amato. Hi, I was just um, going back to what Dr. Um, Richard was saying and what Keith has stated and what I'm reading from Sprinavasa and Sharon. Um, I think there's an opportunity potentially where we can establish what those parameters are for violations and as it relates to I-5 Rose Quarter, if possible, because sometimes in what everybody else is saying and not to beat a dead horse, but sometimes what may be offensive to one may not be the same as others and just not understanding some of the ramifications or, or choices or or maybe statements have been that may be made may not be a you know it, it's just not understood um in all through different lenses and so maybe I, I, maybe this is an ask that is this the committee where we can establish what those um parameters would be or, or could we have input maybe not establishing but um maybe having some input. David did go thoroughly over what the what that looks like as it relates to ODOT, but for I-5, you know, can we can we have a say so and, and kind of what that discipline may look like if it comes to that? Thank you, Dr. Motto. Ms. Sharon Gary Smith. You're muted. 
thank you for recognizing me. And I apologize for my tardiness, a little bit too much family and all um, juggling going on in the new year, or as I call it, another year of. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that I would love, I loved how Dr. Richard kept pushing the question and the line on the question. And I appreciate it, David, Maria, and others attempting to respond and respond and respond, because that means that uh, we're upping the ante on what we're hearing and what we're seeking. Um, but I also think um, I sit on the Governor's Racial Justice Council and this level of state-based discomfort and resistance, and I'm saying that intentionally by bureau heads, by department managers, by people in authority positions to anything that sounds like transformation and change and a leveling or a changing of the playing field. Um, I've heard how hard it is with this wonderful new plan. I would love to imagine since ODOT has proven how fierce it is about driving freeways and other modes of multi-transportation, I'd love to imagine when I hear Megan and others of you come forward and have walked with us, that ODOT would be leading edge around what is acceptable in this I-5 project, what new lens it'll apply, what expectations and craft it it's not that hard to craft new rules of engagement in policies, which then inform the practices. And I think that it could literally shine a light differently, if not you who. We're talking about a long-term project that is moving through a neighborhood that many of us know, love, and lived in. And so part of the restorative justice work could be this. Thank you. Thank you. Always so eloquently stated. Megan, I saw you unmute. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, uh, Ms. Sharon Gary Smith, your comments resonate particularly for tonight's meeting. Um, the last uh, item on our agenda tonight is going to be around performance measures for the restorative justice value. So to your point on making sure that we're shifting the way that we think about this, you know, we're, we're leading with values. And that's something that um, ODOT hasn't done on projects before. Um, we're working together, like what's what's working and um, call us out on what's not working so that we don't repeat that as well. But with that, it's those performance measures too of like all well and good that we have those values, but how do we measure it? And how do we then hold the team accountable to making sure that they're happening um, and those regular check-ins as well? Because if they're not happening, how do we course correct um, and, and make those changes as needed. So I really appreciate everyone's comments um, tonight, but I think those performance measures specific to Rose Quarter are kind of an, an exciting opportunity. Let us know if we're getting it right or not, but an exciting opportunity to start. Thank you so much, Erica, Megan, for coming in. If, if, yes, if I could just say this. So uh, again, David, thank you. Uh, Maria, thank you. Uh, David, in all fairness, uh, I was a union rep, a uh, union president for 15 years. Uh, so I, I get, you know, what you were saying about the progressive discipline process of the SEIU contract 503 article 20 that talks about progressive discipline, right? So in all fairness, I apologize. I did not say that up front. However, you know, I didn't want to go that deep into the process because as Mr. Edwards said, there are some behaviors that don't have to go through progressive discipline, right? They can immediately go to pre-dismissal and termination, et cetera. What, what I'm getting at is when we take something like contracts, and we want to make sure that contracts um, go to uh, 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 ethnic and diverse communities, right? That they have priorities. Disadvantaged businesses have priorities. When I was chair for the Oregon Commission on Black Affairs, routinely, routinely, when we brought these issues up, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, was merely something that was objective and not subjective to the individuals that worked at ODOT. That was my experience. I mean, in another life, I could walk you through all of our issues with contracting and asking for information. And what I'm saying is there has to be accountability for more subjective and less objective, right? That's, that's what I'm getting at. So again, if someone di diverts a contract away from a disadvantaged business or the ethnic community, how is that individual held accountable? 
Honestly, I could care less if they get a letter of expectation with a jeopardy clause. I could care less, right, if they get a discipline. That's an internal process to ODOT. What I care about is what Megan just articulated. How do we course correct when the issue is raised? And how do we rectify the issue so that we don't come back after this process and say, shoulda, coulda, woulda, and oh, by the way, we'll do better next time. Thank you so much. I yield back to Erica. Dr. Richard, that's a very fair question. And I think it goes, I go back to expectations. At the end of the day, it does take a village to get these projects out the door. And somebody does need to be held accountable. And the way we look at, okay, we have goals and outcomes. At the end, at the end of the day, the numbers don't lie. And so if, we're, if we have a target or goal of 15% DBE and we hit 11%, somebody needs to be held accountable. Is it me? Is it procurement? Is it civil rights? Is it the director? Somebody needs to be held accountable. Uh, and uh, without good, clear accountability measures in place, um, I don't know that we're going to see change. And so uh, clearly establishing expectations and what the accountability measures um, are or will be, I think will uh, uh, help encourage change um, within the agency. Because at the end of the day, I can point to OPO and OPO can point to me and nobody owns it. Somebody has to own it. Thank you all. I mean, these are the kinds of discussions. This is the discomfort. These are the uh, um, passionate. Uh, these are the passionate uh, conversations that need to be had. This is the way that we push towards change. Uh, so I appreciate all of you all leaning in. This does not have to be the last time that we engage around this. Uh, and as Megan mentioned, we're going to talk just a little bit uh, in just a moment about some performance measures um, around um, this topic in particular. Mr. Washington, I see your hand. Um, I am going to shift us forward and I can come back to you uh, shortly. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we do not shortchange the conversation around youth engagement. Um, I think our conversations with Camp Elso uh, have been fruitful and uh, that um, your colleague, Sprinavasa, is wanting to make sure that um, she's accountable uh, to this body and that we are uh, moving uh, in the right direction with your leadership guidance, um, with your collaboration. And so I wanted to just open it up again to are there, um, besides those, and I thank you, Leslie, for mentioning those in the chat, um, uh, other strategies, organizations, um, and things that you would like to see by the way of youth engagement. Uh, this is our opportunity to continue to dive into that conversation. Um, uh, the forum on the 14th is being developed uh, with Camp Elso as the facilitator. Um, and uh, I can speak briefly to the desire to open it broadly uh, to have some history about the area, to have conversation about input uh, for those young people to, uh, who are participating to be able to engage uh, with urban design team as well, and for them to be able to see where their input um, lended uh, into the conversation, uh, why it was used or why not, et cetera. So um, I wanted to make sure um, that we are uh, giving just time to that conversation. Uh, if you all are uh, happy with the direction it's going, that is another thing that you can indicate uh, and we'll continue to give you input, but I wanted to make sure uh, that we address that area. Thoughts? Ms. Sharon, I see your hand. I'm sorry. It's more a question of um, information. Yes, what is the time frame for when I think of laying out an ambitious uh, uh, agenda that would engage people, lots of questions and back and forth? What's the time frame since it's focused on youth, correct? I'd love to hear when you've laid out some of the ways that it could move, yes. how much time might be allotted for that. And all of the audiences that we might be inviting from our networks to join us. It can get to be, you know, people get excited when they're asked to engage. 
Indeed. We just demonstrated that. <laughs> Sabrina Vasa, I'd love to have you chime in if you're able to um, on just maybe a brief, I didn't want to share uh, the specifics yet, but brief overview of what that engagement might look like on the 14th. I'm having some audio issues. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. Okay, great. Um, so I'll speak briefly before my internet cuts out again. So um, what we're looking at is four hours um, in the afternoon on the 14th. And that it, right now it's flexible enough um, for everyone to have input on, on what they would like to see. But what we're hoping to do is start with giving some history and context. And that's where I'm really hoping that some of you all who are present um, on HAB can come and share um, your connection to the community, share some of the history background, invite others to come and be our guest elders um, to share with you so that they have that context and history around the place if they maybe don't have that uh, family connection within their family. Um, so we'll have time for that. We will have time to delve into some education so that youth can understand what does engagement look like for a government infrastructure process. So we want to give them a chance to learn um, before they have a chance to share some ideas. Um, moving forward from there, we'll have some time where we can break out, where youth can go in with the design team um, into some smaller sessions and talk about different aspects of the project, learn about them, hear about the decisions that need to be made, talk about them. Um, each one of these mini sessions will need to have a, a facilitator to help guide the conversation, um, to help with the note taking, and then ultimately to bring the group back together at the end. So that way the youth together can build some consensus around the top three things that they would like to see um, as you know sharing their collective voice the top three things that they would like to see um, the team move forward on and then we'll have um, someone from the project team be or from ODOT specifically be able to report back on here's our plan on how we plan to move forward here's our plan on how we plan to re-engage the folks the young adults who attended um, on what we were able to move forward on um, what we were not able to move, what they were not able to move forward on and why um, as kind of that, that loop. Um, and if this goes well in May, my hope is that it's something that you all would like to see continued in the future. Um, again, while ELSO is, is hosting as a facilitator, this cannot happen without us all agreeing to put the word out to our networks, without us having um, folks who are great facilitators and great at, at building consensus around youth step forward to say, hey, I'd be happy to help with that, um, that small group session because my team is small. Um, small but mighty, but um, we really want to build in that accountability loop to HAB um, and making sure that everybody feels like their organizational connections and relationships and networks are valued. Thank you so much for that. There was a question, Spinavasa, in the uh, chat about age group. Um, want to make sure we're, what, what is our thought around um, age for youth engagement? So for this particular session, we're going to be focused on the high school age um, college students. If they aren't in school or if they're remote, they can also participate. Um, I would like to explore with you all um, how to replicate something similar for middle school age. Um, I just had a conversation with uh, the some of the educators at Tubman Middle School. And, you know, with Tubman being kind of at the crux and in the middle of this, it's really important that we give that community of youth a chance to weigh in because they're going to be most closely impacted by this. So um, as you all are thinking about youth to invite and also facilitators and age groups, um, feel free to reach out to me at any point in time and share ideas or to Erica because she and I will be connecting and, and working closely and um, around how to construct this and make sure that it's age appropriate um, and that we're also setting ourselves up for success without trying to address too many age groups in one space at one time. Great, thank you. Other thoughts or comments, um, input 
Um, this is really, really exciting. I think that multi-generational piece and making sure that we're teaching our young people how to engage uh, in this process. And, and to Mr. Washington's comment, what other uh, opportunities there are aligned with uh, an infrastructure package or project this big and um, where they might have um, opportunity for a career, a choice and where they want to influence uh, their communities uh, moving forward. Other thoughts around youth engagement? This is a, a um, developing conversation. Uh, so there'll be opportunity to continue to input. Uh, Sharon, thank you uh, for your comment. Um, definitely there are other uh, youth engagement CBOs and there are our networks uh, that we want to plug into this opportunity. Uh, and so um, as we further develop, we'll be looking to you uh, for your network, for your wisdom um, and how we um, accomplish this and accomplish it well. Um, Mr. Edwards, did you have a comment? I just want to spend a while to know that I gave just gave her a virtual hug. So she, I just want her to know that. <laughs> Thank you. You must have heard my daughter screaming in the background. <laughs> I can use that hug. I appreciate it. <laughs> Mr. Washington, um, did you have a comment here or did I want to need to come back to you in regards to um, our previous talk? No, it was about our previous talk. This conversation here is, is, is fine. I'm good with this. Okay. Let's go. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for engaging around this. Um, I am looking forward to continuing the work uh, with, with Kim Elso and other uh, youth engagement CBOs and how we um, bridge uh, this opportunity to include our young people. Um, with that, I'm going to, Natalie, if you'll share the slides, I want to be a good steward of our time and I'm going to move forward so that we can dive into the performance measures. Several of you joined um, us uh, in our repurposed design collaboration forum and uh, gave some good, we had some great interaction around these. And so I'm going to um, shift to Miss Monica as she shares with us uh, in this performance measures piece. Thanks, Erica. Uh, great conversation tonight, and it's great to be back with you uh, this evening, have members for the third part of our series of discussions around performance measures. Um, and today, like Megan mentioned and Erica mentioned earlier, we'll be talking about uh, the critically important topic of our restorative justice performance measures. Um, like I've said before, I just want to reiterate again tonight that these are truly draft measures uh, for your consideration, and we want to hear from you if these are the right metrics in determining success um, of the project, and we're looking to engage together today in that open discussion. Um, so last week, we started a bit of that discussion through the design collaboration forum, and as I walk through these, I'll talk about um, a little bit about that feedback um, that we received as I review each, each of the measures tonight. Um, you'll also see that feedback that we re received in the collaboration forum as, a, as um, showing as tracked changes in the Google documents that Erica sent out um, last week prior to the meeting. Um, so that ensures that all of the HAB members that weren't able to attend kind of see those changes that were made during the collaboration forum. Um, and I wanna say thank you to everyone that was able to participate in last week's collaboration forum. Um, and please continue to provide written feedback in that Google document if that's um, how you would like to provide feedback in addition to our discussion tonight. So on to the, yeah. Um, just a quick slide reminder here about what a performance measure is. We've been talking about these for a couple of meetings now um, and what the performance measure should be. Um, next slide, Natalie. Again, a quick reminder um, that there are 27 measures. Um, most of these we've reviewed together already. And today uh, we're going to discuss the restorative justice uh, performance measures. On to the next slide. So first for uh, restorative justice, looking at what we are proposing to track quantitatively or numerically um, is around adding developable land, providing opportunities for the historic albina community, 
increasing market opportunities um, and creating wealth for the historic albina community, supporting cultural heritage and education and training opportunities. Um, a note, some feedback we received during the design collaboration forum was to include considering uh, a time frame associated with the dollars of budget committed uh, as to how uh, long those funds would last for programming and so forth. Um, next, recruiting groups not traditionally represented in decision making who are interested um, in construction industry careers, uh, providing immediate economic benefit to the historic Albina community, um, as well as creating enduring opportunities for wealth creation uh, for the historic Albina community. And again, some feedback from the design collaboration forum is potentially include language going beyond the mid-level management promotions that are in that language to also include and track um, higher level executive promotions that happen throughout the duration of the project. So those are the quantitative measures. And then on to um, the qualitative measures uh, that we're looking to track and report on, um, you know, again, through lists of strategies and actions or elements of the project. Um, is supporting additional career training opportunities beyond construction. So some conversation around that here tonight. Um, some feedback from the design collaboration forum as well as adding job opportunities um, and increased capacity to this measure. Um, and then second, delivering accelerated tangible results and benefits to the historic Albina community. Um, through our uh, different executed agreements throughout the project. So next thing um, that we provided and discussed um, at the collaboration forum and kind of feedback from, um, from some of our discussions is the glossary of terms. So that was part of your packet as well. So this covers what we mean um, by all of the underlined words or phrases that are used um, in the measures, things like purposeful, informed, influenced. Um, and we've broken down these uh, glossary definitions or terms into seven different categories that you can see listed on the screen here. So first being process. So these are terms related to um, projects procedures, think of key decisions um, as one of those terms. Uh, in the purpose, so terms related to particular purpose or an end, things like intentional. Um, so in the design collaboration form, we received uh, the recommendation to replace our use of meaningful with intentional or purposeful. So uh, we also revised respected to focus more on valued um, and we clarified that systemic racism um, for our project specifically referring to racial discrimination. Um, and I also on the glossary, I um, wanna be clear that these are what we wanna define for our project. So that's why we wanna, we wanna have the glossary of terms that maybe have you know, generally a broader meaning, but we wanna make sure our glossary specifically um, defines what we want those terms to mean for our project. So that helps us be accountable um, and helps us track, um, you know, specifically what is, what is meant by our performance measures. Um, so the next category is transportation. These are terms um, related to transportation infrastructure, environment and activities, things like low stress. So think of these as kind of some of the jargon terms that planners and engineers often use. We wanna make sure those are defined. Um, impacts, uh, durations or timeframes over which performance measures are anticipated to demonstrate outcomes or be measured. Um, Often we can estimate an outcome now, but we won't really know the results until construction. So um, defining some of that. Uh, financial, so these terms are related to market and development, financial opportunities, actions or activities. Um, think financial capacity. Uh, the built environment, terms related to land use, and development and construction and urban environment. Think of terms such as streetscapes. What do we mean when we say streetscapes? Um, and then last, we have cultural. So terms related to cultural or community features or activities. Think of things such as when we say cultural heritage. 
Um, so in the in the design collaboration forum, we revised culturally reflective to better capture values and influence of the com uh, of the community. We also changed the definition of um, the term groups that have not been traditionally represented in decision making. So the definition we had was the industry um, standard Title VI definition, but for our project, we want to clarify that our use of that term means Black and Indigenous community members of historic albina. So we made that revision. Um, and last, we uh, ensured the definition of restorative neighborhood, made sure we added educational opportunities in addition to the other opportunities that were listed um, in that definition. So that that um, hopefully will help continue to provide some clarity around, um, around the performance measures and looking to get your feedback on that as well. Uh, so on to the next slide. So per our review schedule, uh, we'll be engaging in similar discussions uh, around performance measures with the COAC starting this month uh, and then moving into the spring. And after this initial round of feedback, we'll be bringing those uh, refined measures back later this spring uh, to begin the next step of goal setting. So as a little teaser to the goal setting, uh, the next slide is just um, an example, uh, a preview example for some up upcoming goal setting discussions. So right now, um, as you're looking at the performance measures, we just say for an example, number of changes made to the project. But is that five changes? Is that 25 changes? Is that 50 changes? What is the right measure of success towards real tangible outcomes and results? Um, that's what we want to talk through next uh, in, our, in our approach for recording that. And that in this case, using the tools we've developed like the HAB uh, meeting summaries and the design collaboration forums and the input matrices. So starting to dive deep into, um, into those goals and that tracking and our team has gathered a lot of information to help inform that discussion. Um, and that will be our next steps here after we, after we gather your uh, uh, feedback. And then, um, the final slide that I have for today, I get again, I just want to reiterate while we're uh, discussing goal setting, the team will also be working on the plan for implementing the processes and procedures for tracking against these measures and, and their, their associated goals. And the results um, of that effort will then be reported to you and communicated on our website to hold us accountable in making our progress um, and having discussions on where we need to course correct. And this is just an example template that we've been using um, to show how that may be reported. Um, and with that, Erica, I'll turn it back over to you to facilitate some more discussion. Indeed, thank you for sharing, Monica. I appreciate uh, the work that you all did on this and those who have the opportunity to join us uh, to have a deeper dive. Um, we are making intricate changes and uh, some of the conversation that we had earlier around what really um, are we looking to as success? What are outcomes? How do we measure them? Um, and um, utilizing that to make sure that this project uh, is, is a model, right? Uh, going forward that people can look to this project and say they listened to the community, the community had input on this many things, uh, and there was this much growth uh, in economic development. And so we wanted to have an opportunity to engage with you. Is there something that we missed uh, in this area of restorative justice and the quantitative or in the quality? Are there measures on the list that maybe are uh, more important or less important. Uh, I wonder if it would be helpful uh, to maybe pull them up as we have uh, some of the discussion uh, and see uh, if there are thoughts from HAB members. Natalie, if you would um, maybe bring up the slide uh, in relationship to the quantitative uh, uh, measures uh, in regards to restorative justice um, as a kind of a um, preview to spark our conversation. Thank you. 
Awesome. So I want to open the discussion to HAB members. Um, if you are seeing something that's missing, those things here that you see that maybe are more important or less important, we wanna get your input here. Um, and um, I'll, I'll open the floor. I believe the intent of the project team is to make sure that this is really what the community is reflecting, right? That the project team is not setting goals um, just kind of haphazardly, but that th this really has value um, within the community. So we're looking to you. Your input here is, is extremely valuable. Um, this is where your expertise and your connection to this community really does help the project team move this forward. I know a lot when we were talking about the cover, we talked about this developable land and how much that is, um, that is, can be measured quantitatively. Um, market opportunities creating wealth. I know that's in Mr. Washington's wheelhouse. Um, and uh, maybe the last measure and the second measure, I'm not sure the clarification there, um, enduring opportunities, um, thoughts about um, these quantitative restorative justice measures. Sharon, I see your hand. I just wanted to ask for a clarification or a suggestion. When we're talking about responding to concerns or questions or even recommendations made by the uh, HAB, can we, as you're making the changes, whether it's five or 25, I'd love to see without too much additional burden on you, I would like to see why you responded, what about the question or the recommendation resonates sufficient for it to be inserted or something to be removed so that I'm actually capturing also the nature of what we're asking or sharing or care about that it then begins to reframe or frame the actual work that'll go forth. Uh, and also when I look at these quantitative measures, and I love quantitative and qualitative, it might be a small point, but where it says, um, increase market opportunities, the second, creating wealth, and then the final, create enduring opportunities for wealth creation, I think about restoration and creation, and they may be the same, but for me, it is a different kind of a, it has a time frame to it. Wealth was taken, wealth opportunities were removed or reduced or marked, minimized. So I think about, I, I keep hearing helping African-Americans of lower albina and African-Americans in Oregon, Portland period, create wealth, we had wealth. So I guess I wanna see how do we talk about the replacement, whether it is how the land decisions, how the development around the project happens. So it's creation of new and replacement for me. And uh, I think it lifts it up and amplifies it differently. But I'd love to see why the change is being considered and then made, what was the relevance of it to the project and the longer term um, restoration that we're talking about. Thanks for hearing me out. That's excellent. Other thoughts? Ms. Monica, I saw you unmute. Yeah, I was just going to say absolutely, um, Ms. Sharon, we will be tracking, um, you know, detailed of what the feedback was and where we implemented it or didn't and how and why and that kind of stuff. So be definitely on the lookout for that. Thanks for responding. Other thoughts from HAB members in regards to uh, these particular measures? Are there anything that we're missing? I, I heard that missing piece of restoration. Um, do these resonate with you? Do you think this is a good base for us? And again, um, understanding that this uh, could be a working document um, as, as the project grows and changes, um, but want to know if you feel like the team is on the right track. Are there things other things that, that we're not seeing.
Mr. Washington, do you feel like this adequately captures the entrepreneurial uh, um, and um, other opportunities that aren't particularly uh, directly related to uh, construction? It, it was kind of funny that you asked me that question because actually I was thinking something totally opposite. Okay. You know, and it sort of has some, it resonates with that earlier conversation around equity. And, um, but it's, as a clinician, it's, I find it really fascinating that how we're approaching this is to some degree from a linear level, from a linear approach. It's, most of this stuff is, is rooted in thinking and experiencing some structural realities from a cognitive standpoint of view. And I, and I find it kind of fascinating really because you know, that kind of stuff doesn't really affect behavioral change. And so it's, it's sort of like the one part that we seem to be missing is the spiritual development that is, you know, because that deprivation comes as a result of that constant bombardment of negative result, negative experience. We get a spiritual depletion, but also when we look in that behavioral change, I mean, you know, I find it really funny when you look at, well, it ain't funny, but it's kind of it's funny to me because when you start thinking about it, you know, we're, we're trying to address a historical a system that has history and roots. And it's kind of funny because, um, you know, I was talking to some people in my backyard fence over at the pool. It has, and it was a really nice backdrop. It had ivy. The fence is an ivy fence. And, and so over the years, I've been trimming this ivy and doing all this. And a strong wind came about a couple of weeks back and blew the fence over with the ivy and everything. And I was telling somebody about the ivy. And I found as the ivy fell over, I was able to see on the top of it because the ivy was over seven feet tall almost. But on the top of the ivy, there's some berries. And I was telling, I was funny with the lady that's the horticulture, the person that do the plants and all that. I said, yeah, well, have you ever seen ivy grow berries before? And they laughed and they go, yeah, that... <laughs> then that, that ivy tree, that's turned into a tree and it's found a home. You know, I, you know that's a, a reality as a result. I mean, I look at this whole reality of what we're talking about and I'm going, well, you know, how do we get a deeper meaning, deeper impact, how do we get people behavioral change? I mean, because when we start looking at people even in the workplace, we put up all these conditions for them, the whole thing, right? And put these mandates like we're forced... And it's almost like the shot, the whole ear, the whole same thing we're dealing with in this country about dealing with shots, you know, taking the vaccination, half the country taking it, half of it won't. But this whole na notion that we're going to somehow another be able to affect affect change without going deeper than just a linear approach to it is something that disturbs me a little bit. So I guess the, the about that is to look at it as we're looking than just some physical surface changes or some mandates, but are we really implementing something that are that are really challenging people to do some form of internal uh, growth or internal change? That's good. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Washington. Other other HAB members? And realize again, this isn't the only opportunity. Um, again, these have gone out to you. Um, this is where we're looking to you, Mr. Washington and Mr. Edwards and to, you know, Andrew, Ms. Sharon, we're looking to you all uh, to give input. Mr. Edwards, I see your hand up. Thank you very much, uh, Erica. Um, and uh, I, can't, I, I know what John's talking about, but I guess the challenge that we have here, this is a silo and there are forces that created all of this that, and for, there are outside forces that um, we have no control over and within the parameters of this project. And that's, that's challenging in and of itself. Um, see, I, I believe that racism runs through every thread and every fabric of this country, um, here, here. be it education, be it um, employment, be it housing, be it um, financial institutions, business, you name it. And trying to tackle that in this silo is challenging in and of itself because there are so many outside influences 
that created this. But at the same time, we're working in, in a silo that has no um, has no um, no influence outside, but it's been shaped and formed by outside influences. So that that's a huge challenge in and of itself. And you know, I don't want to get the whole bunch of philo philosophical stuff, but I think that's the reality of it. You know, um, it's like trying to fix. Um, one school in a school system that is historically um, um, racist, and you're going to fix it, fix one school. That's not going to solve the problem. And it's challenging to fix that one school when it's being influenced by all the schools around it. So I, 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 I understand the frustration, um, John, and um, but I don't know how we tackle that. In our in in this narrow um, silo that that we're in, thank you for that, Mr. Edwards. Other thoughts, Andrew? I see your hand. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. It's nice to hear and see y'all. Uh, just more of a question. Um, I know this is a working draft. Um, and I know this is a quantitative measures, but there's really no numbers in this quantitative measurement. So I was just curious to know if like, if ODOT going to be coming up with the numbers or if like if the HAB going to come up with the numbers with this quantitative measurement for like each section since, you know, so that's more of a question. I can respond to that, Erica. So what our team has done is gathered a lot of information um, to kind of develop a range of what we see, like what we've done on the project, things like what are the, what are the square feet? So for, the developable land, for instance, what's our total developable land um, within the project and kind of developing those ranges um, anywhere you see a number or a percent or something like that currently um, to, to, to give the HAB some background information to a, the HAB will set those goals. So, um, but our team has done kind of that legwork to help you inform that decision or ask questions on the legwork that we've done um, and, and help help facilitate that discussion. So that's coming here in the spring. Okay, that's good to know because I know we've been talking about social equity and everything and it's like, well, if we're not really involved in the numbers, um, it's hard for ODOT to model uh, social equity especially all the accountability talk that we've heard earlier is kind of um so it's good to hear that and we'll all uh be in interested to hear and see what the have will have to say when it comes more to the numbers but that's all i have appreciate it thank you other thoughts I want to uh, reiterate that you all have these and I'm more than happy to resend them. I understand that we all get bogged down with hundreds of emails a day, um, but there is a document and opportunity for you all to make your comments, uh, for you to make your suggestions and additions for you um, as you have time um, <laughs> not like you're not engulfed in other uh, opportunities and organizations, uh, but we appreciate um, your input, your investment into this um, as we um, work together uh, to make sure that there are outcomes that the community uh, can be proud of. Uh, I know that you all uh, have, a number of you have been in this work a lot longer than myself. And so you understand that there are gives and takes, but how do we uh, get the greatest benefit uh, and then 
as uh, Ms. Sharon stated, how do we understand how those things were applied? What were the reasons? Um, why we were at this number, et cetera. So I want you all to take advantage of um, sitting with some of this information and adding those comments. Um, it's an internal document for us to be able to work through. Um, so we don't have to wordsmith tonight, but um, as you think further about quantitative and qualitative measures, uh, take the opportunity to just give us some comments, input and feedback. Um, Natalie, if you would put up um, uh, the slides for me, I want to encourage you and thank you for those who have had capacity uh, and who have participated in the design collaboration forums. Um, it's really exciting to see um, those deeper dive conversations. Often in this arena, we don't have the time or the opportunity for folks to engage in that kind of um, uh, manner that we would even in a um, in-person meeting, but the design collaboration forum uh, space gives us an opportunity to do that. Uh, so those who have capacity, please feel free to attend. The invitation is open to all HAB members, uh, though there were um, about half of you that said um, you had regular capacity to attend, please just stop in. Um, the design team is um, doing an excellent job in engaging um, with your colleagues uh, and beginning to incorporate those ideas. And so um, as we go into the next forum, we'll be focused um, more on um, urban design, uh, but thank you uh, to James and his team for allowing us to repurpose uh, so that we didn't have to ask for another meeting time on your schedule. Um, so you all are going to continue to give input, hopefully, on these performance measures and the goals that will allow the team, as Monica said, to go back and start adding some of their homework, their deep dive, uh, and allowing us to help shape what those goals are. Those are our next uh, steps. So identifying the measures and then the next step would be the goals, which are those, those numbers uh, and how we uh, meet those um, Future considerations as well, the infrastructure design, overcrossings, landscaping, that urban design, how do we infuse Albina and the history of our neighborhood, our culture uh, on this project uh, and things that will be standing uh, for generations, uh, direction on highway and local street solutions, uh, and then getting your input on community engagement, uh, one in particular, the youth engagement piece. So I thank you to uh, all of you who um, are willing to leverage your networks uh, and help us to reach deeper into the community uh, and help to educate our young people. Uh, and um, we want to make sure uh, that we're doing well, that we are doing justice uh, to the community um, and your input is so vitally important to that. Um, with that, next slide, Ms. Natalie. I want to thank you all for joining us. I realize that this is an investment. It is a love and a passion for the community and wanting to see change, wanting to see um, uh, the community benefit from projects like this. Um, I appreciate the work of the project team uh, and the shift. David and Maria, thank you uh, for your work uh, with the organization, because that's kind of what Mr. Edwards was talking about. It's like, so that we're not siloed, that the agency is making those changes alongside the project, that we're moving in concert. Uh, it will be a much more impactful um, as we try to make these shifts towards equity. Uh, that people are seeing the benefit. And I've been sharing with the project team since I came on board that really it is about internal shift uh, and uh, our engagement together is making sure that we're able to um, evaluate personally because all of us may not stay at ODOT. All of us may not stay on this project. Uh, all of us may not be engaged here, but it's how we move to the next project, how we move to the next thing. Uh, and those philosophies, those things that we have gained uh, in this project that shape us into something different and better uh, and um, show us what we're made of, correct? Dr. Holden, any closing thoughts for us as we end our meeting tonight? Great conversation, uh, job well done as always. Erica, so important for everybody to lean in. Thank you so much for being willing to give your time and your investment and your energy. Interesting that it's on the hills of the weekend we just celebrated, Martin Luther King. 
and reflecting what was going on in the 60s. And if you stop and consider that home ownership for African Americans is at the same number it was in 1965, it lets us know that there's much work that we need to do. Um, if it isn't internal policies, systems, procedures, all of that won't matter. It's the changing of the heart, it's the changing of the mind, it's the willingness of people like you to own it, not just publicly, but to own it privately, to own it in the conversations at the dinner table, to own it in the conversations at the gym, to own it in the conversations when you're out to lunch with friends. It is you being an advocate to make sure this isn't just a project or a process, but this is real change. You're the drum majors for justice. Let's go and make sure we keep the beat. Good night, everybody. Thank you all. Good night.